There we go. Got some fire in the wire now. How's everybody? I'm just going to say they got you, bro. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You just, it, it, the scripture says, be ye also ready. <laughs> It is a blessing to be back here once again in your presence. We want to thank you for the the show of love and for the services that myself and my pastor provides to this body that God has entrusted into our hands. As my sister Gloria mentioned earlier, this country has been rocked once again this past week, you know, and and um, there has never been a, a greater time in history in my mind since I've been alive that God's people need to show up. Amen. You know, um, I came in the door singing the song, Trouble in My Way. See, because all of us go through something. You know what I'm saying? So I'm singing a song, Trouble in My Way. You know, I'm working it, you know, because see, cause see, I know, I know my God is sitting high looking low, and he's caring about what I'm going through, and he doesn't allow me to go through it just to say Patrick went through something. He uses it, and if I let him to use it, he'll use it to bless so many more if I let him. And so I'm excited. I'm encouraged. I was listening to the songs this morning. Y'all took me back to home with the first song this morning. I'm like, oh, because I was was about to come around here and hit my knee because normally when that song was sung when I was a kid, the first one, one of the deacons would get up and he would hit his knees while the song was still being sung and then he would start to talk to the master from the front pew and he would start, Father, this is your poor week and unworthiness. That's the reason why I pray that way today because it touched me because I'm looking at a man who had been through some things in life and who I looked up to spiritually and he hits his knees and says, Master, this is your poor week and unworthy servant. Come and humble before your throne of grace and mercy and the song is still going. Going. See, that takes me someplace. Wow. It's nothing greater in my mind to be ushered into the presence of the Lord when you hit your knees or you close your eyes or you talk to him. And it's such a powerful thing. And, and on Thursday, I had a chance to talk to a young lady. She says, who, she simply just shared, I wish we prayed more. Whoa. I wish we prayed more. She's talking about the church. I wish we prayed more. Because, see, we know that there's power in prayer because we always say, well, I'll pray for you, right? So you don't want to do something that doesn't have any power in it. We know prayer has power. So when's the last time we grabbed hands and touched and agreed? Come on now. See, as I'm going over the word and, and as God has continued to minister to me, and I'm looking at what's happening in with the folks who've lost their lives in the shooting and those who are left behind trying to pick up the pieces and the first responders and all these things, you know, right? And I'm going, God, we know you are still sovereign even in these times. But it's paramount on how we respond as the believer to encourage, to come alongside, to pray for even those who did the wrong. That's the big piece, to pray for those who even did the wrong. See, there's nothing more convicting in my heart than to be reading God's word and to be angry at someone who has done such a heinous thing. And not remember what he says in his word. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. See, we we think persecution is when they just make things difficult on you. Persecution can lead all the way to death. That's real. And so when I'm realizing that when things are happening and people are doing something, we're, we, we, we should be praying for the victims and we should be praying for the loved ones that's left behind. But we also need to pray for those who did it and their loved ones because, see, they're left trying to figure it out and carry on because now their family name has this stain. And we got to remember that. We have to remember that. See, I'm... Tremendously blessed. Tremendously. And as I read his word, and even as he has prepared me to come and speak this morning, when you read
read the scriptures first, Peter chapter 3, verses 8 through 9. Do y'all realize this section is about life and how to live it more abundantly? He says in verse 10, he's talking to those who desire life, to love, and to see good days. That's how he described the Christian. Those who desire life, to love, and to see good days. Pete, do you have me? There he is. But he also goes on and says, must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. He must turn away from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. So so if you have your Bibles with you, if you would turn with me to... um, 1 Peter chapter 3, starting at the 8th verse. Say amen when you have it, not so it on me. Amen. While you're looking for it, um, our habits in our life is often one of the greatest threats to our faith. Our habits. Oh, mercy. Do y'all realize that? Because see, for a habit to become a habit, they say it takes 21 days is what it normally says. If you're asking anyone, it takes 21 days for a habit to become a habit, right? So that means that it's something you've introduced into your life that at some point you said, I'm going to try this, and then you just kept going along with it, right? And then eventually it stuck and it became a part of you, okay? Now the sad thing is, is that works true for good habits and bad habits, Amen? And so the thing is, is that oftentimes we don't know the difference in between a good habit and a bad habit because if we enter, allow it to enter into our life and we've consistently done it long enough, it's something that we're willing to welcome into our life. Let us read. To sum up, all of you be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. For you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. For the ones who desires life to love and to see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. He must turn away from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous, and his ears attend to their prayer. But those But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Let us pray. My loving Father, once again, Master, this is your poor, weak, and unworthy servant coming home before your throne of grace and mercy. Just simply to say thank you, Lord. Thanking you for this day. Thanking you for another opportunity to stand and be used in your service before going to the grave. But Father God, the hour has come where your people have gathered themselves together once again to hear from on high. So Master, as your servant stands in Peter's shoes this morning, Father, I pray for preaching power that you fill me afresh anew with your Holy Spirit and that you would bless me to be able to rightly divide your word of truth before them. And Father God, you are our Master and our Savior and our Redeemer and will be forever careful to always remember to give you all the praise the honor and the glory and it's in your darling son Christ Jesus mighty and holy name we ask it all and the body of Christ says together amen Amen. and amen this morning's sermon sermon title is called desiring life part three desiring life part three you ready give him some Pete the apostle Paul considered to lose everything that he thought he had gained just so that he might gain Christ. He counted all the attributes that was associated to him. Hebrew of Hebrews, born of the tribe of Benjamin, all those wonderful things, right? He said it's dumb just so that he might gain Christ. If you top your outline, you will find these words, the good life. It says the good life is a godly life that is lived with the right attitude toward people and having the right godly response to life's trials and tribulations, all while living by God's standard. So once again, I welcome you this morning, and as we come to the third and final part of this series on desiring life, my prayer is that what Peter has taught us up to this point has clearly revealed to us what it takes to live the good life. You see, God never promised a believer a life without troubles, but just to the contrary. Psalms 34 verse 19a says this, Many are the afflictions of the righteous. 
And see, and God gave a promise to the righteous that when trouble comes, he would be right there. So Psalms 34 verse 19b says this, But the Lord delivers him out of them all. And so the world's image of the good life is often defined as the pursuit of sin. Because we seem to forsake any and everything godly in our pursuit of the world's good life. Because the world's definition of the good life is one of immorality and of excessiveness and ultra luxury and doing your own thing. I am so tired of hearing the word, I'm going to do me. I'm going to do me. What does that mean? When you're going to do you. Because I but yeah, I know what it means. It means that you're going to be very selfish in your perspective. I'm going to do me. Okay? And so, to look at the four basic commands Peter is giving to the church on how to live the good life, we find out that it's not about what you have, but about how you live. Amen. Amen. It's not about what you have. It's about how you live. And so Peter has given us two of the four commands thus far on how to live the good life in Christ. And and it's in verse 8 that he shares with us that we must have the right attitude. And first, if we're going to have a chance at living the good life, it says this in verse 8. To sum up, all of you be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit. And that's enough right there to throw most of us out the boat. I can do one, but I can't do all. Because, see, we would love it when we get to cherry pick those attributes, right? Well, today I'll be humble. Tomorrow I'll be kindly. You know, but he's saying this is what needs to be in you at all times. And here's where it hurts. you got to remember the church is going through some things, and he's telling them that those who's persecuting you, who's harming you and so forth, that you still have to find the way to be this way, harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit. And that is a problem for us because, see, I'm hurting. And I don't feel like those things. Aren't you glad salvation is not a feeling? Because, see, he says you need to know that you know. And it's the same thing that when you know that he's in you and he's the head of your life and then when ugly comes, you've got to bow your neck a little bit and you press on and you find a way to be harmonious. You find a way to be sympathetic. You find a way to be brotherly. You find a way to be kind hearted and humble in spirit because that's what he did. You see, if we have the right attitude toward people, believers as well as non-believers, then we're on the right path to living the good life. But Peter also tells us that the right attitude alone is not enough to live the good life. For it's in verse 9 that he tells us that we must also have the right response to life's trials and tribulations as well. Verse 9 says this, Not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead, for you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. You see, it's here in verse 9 that Peter identifies three responses that must be found actively in use in the life of a child of God. The first one in verse 9a deals with our action where he says, not returning evil for evil. See, Christians are not to return evil for evil. And if we're doing it, we must stop. And if we're not doing it, then we don't, we shouldn't start at all. And that's the part. Because see, again, like I said last week, we're built for the fight. We're built for it. Perfect example. D, can I use your gas station? Okay. Getting gas yesterday um, at Arco. My bride told me to get out the car and go get her beverage, and I'm a good husband. I got out the car and went to go get the beverage. And uh, so while I'm in there, ping, you know, looking for the particular type she wanted, she moved the car on up in position to get ready to pump gas in it. And I don't know. I'm in there buying beverages. I get the beverages and a snicker, too. Oh, I didn't need it. <laughs> right before we went to go get the suit. <laughs> mm-hmm. 
Yeah. And so I come back out, and I, she's in position. She goes, well, I just got here. And I'm like, oh, okay. So she gets in the car and sits down, and I'm over there pumping gas. And I notice that the car facing us, so now that she's going this way, facing this way, and this other car pulls in and is facing this way. And it was already there when I walked out, and she gets in the car. Now I'm standing here pumping gas into the car, and all of a sudden I see the, the occupants of the car in front of us, just parked in front of us, the son, I guess he's the son, he's videotaping me and taking pictures of me. And I'm thinking, maybe they think I'm somebody, you know. <laughs> Let me get you one of those, right? And and I could see the lady turning her phone and she's talking while she's videoing in the car, you know, and I'm like, I don't know who they think I am, but I'm not that person because I'm just trying to get gas so I can go find a suit, you know. And so I finished putting gas in the car and so forth, and the lady gets out and she looks and I'm... And I jump in the car with Dion, and Dion proceeds to tell me that this lady in front of us is probably not very happy with her. Because what was going on was this, is that um, Arco was crazy yesterday with everybody and their mama trying to get in there and get some petrol like it was the last the gas station before the, the Jesus comes back. And um, so cars were just... But we got behind and she was moving forward in. So this lady, she decided she's going to whip around, but she was in the wrong, her tank thing was on the wrong side of the car from where she was trying to go. So she went to go back up and come around. And so Dion told her when she had pulled up that, that she, she went like this, like saying, I'm going to go backwards to give you some room. And the lady just looked at her. And Dion backs up. And so we don't know if she was upset because Dion didn't back up far enough or that she thought Dion was telling her to come around. But we made social media somehow yesterday. <laughs> Not for a good thing, apparently. I, caught out. I said, baby, I'm pretty sure now that you tell me, I realized I got caught in the video because of you. They, they were trying to make sure everybody in trouble that's with you. Okay? So, so but, but that was the thing is that people don't talk. Yeah. It, it, it's sweet. Right. And, and so, and, and, and we don't, I don't know what her dialogue was, but I don't think she was saying how good a person Dion was in this experience, you know. And, and, and here's what challenges me is because here's the thing is that you don't want to return evil for evil because see, you're built for this because in our heart and our mind, we did nothing to harm this person. But now we're still realizing that they weren't happy. And so we're driving away and part of the conversation was like, well, why was, why, you know, and I'm like, you got to let it go now. You can't change it. You can't change it. But this is where we are. This is where we are. And he's saying, this is what you need to look like. Not returning evil for evil. And then you got to take whatever gal or whatever you was going to have in your mouth about and throw it away. You got to throw it away. You know. And so it's nothing worse than having a, a, a instant mom, a moment where God actually says, okay, look, you remember we're studying this, right? Okay, this just happened. Take that. Throw it away. And you go, but yeah, but, 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 but God, but, but, throw it away. No, 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 but you don't, no, 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 but throw it away. So, so now you're learning what you're supposed to do. You got to let it go, right? Because here's what it says. Christians are not to return evil for evil. And if we're not, and, we're, we are, and if we are doing it, we must stop. And we are not to start doing it if we're not. Because Romans 12, 19 says this. Take, never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. So here's the thing. You do and you own you in this experience for how you know you start to respond when situations happen in your life. And if you are unable to talk with that person or reconcile with that person, God handles all the other. He handles all the other. Just make sure that your actions was righteous. Because the second one deals with our mouth. Verse 9b says, not returning insult for insult. Christians are not to use abusive language or cursing or speak evil of someone. And to do so is an unacceptable response for believers. Do y'all hear that? It's an unacceptable response for believers. Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 29 these words, Let no unwholesome words proceed from your mouth, but only such a word is good for the edification according to the need of the moment. Y'all get that? The need of the moment? So that it will give grace to those who hear. Do you know how many times we pollute people with information they don't need to know or hear? Because we've got to. You see what I'm saying? Because they can't unhear or unexperience what you put out there. But if you're blessing someone in a positive mode in their ear hustle.
hustling and they get something, they got a blessing and not a curse. Amen. See, I'm talking about, he's talking about how to have a good, good life. The third one is our response. Verse 9c says this, giving a blessing instead. And so you say, well, how do you give them a blessing? By loving them unconditionally. See, when you love somebody unconditionally, it does not mean that you approve of what they've done. Do you get that? When you love someone unconditionally, does that mean that you approve of what they've done? Because, see, that you're, when you love them what, the way God says, when it says love right there, it's the agape in love. It's the love from your will. So the object that's actually being loved can do nothing to add or take away or lose that love because it's not based on the object. It's based on the one doing the loving. So that's the thing. When you can love someone, that's how you can love your enemy. That's how you can love them. Because... You're not looking for anything in them to create love for you. But then also you can be a blessing to them by praying for their salvation or for their spiritual growth. By expressing gratitude for them. I've been saying all week long in these meetings going to Cleveland, I'm going to Disneyland. I've been saying it. I'm going to Disneyland because here's the thing. I'm speaking a positive place in my mind where I'm going because historically every time I've stepped foot on the soil there, it has not been the place of Disneyland. It has not been the happiest place on earth. But I'm telling myself I'm going to Disneyland. Ask my team. They'll tell you. Patrick, where are you going to? Is it Disneyland? Because, see, I have to be able to give myself a clean slate if I'm going to do the things I need to do righteously. Not bitter. What I put together in the presentation is all truth. But it was written with a righteous heart. And so a tainted heart from historical issues can't give that presentation. So I'm going to Disneyland in Cleveland. (laughs) But you see, the greatest blessing we can give someone, the ultimate blessing, is forgiveness. In Mark chapter 11, verse 25, Jesus says this, Whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against one another, so that your Father in heaven who, so that your Father who is in heaven will also forgive you your transgressions. See, we often tell people you need to forgive and forget. Virtually an impossible. You can forgive, but we don't ever forget. But you have the ability to let it go. See, I, I got to teach this past Tuesday about when you say you give something to God and you go in there and give it to him like this. How does he get it out your hand? See, we want God to come in and pry. Come on, give me the pinky. Give me the, come on, come on, come on. We want him to pry it out of our hands and say, no, no. When you say you're giving it away to God, you walk off in there, you open the hands up. It's like this. He takes it away. And not like, like I, I use the a analogy or an example of in the old days. We used to come to the altar to pray. And the pastor would be up at the pool pit and everybody would come down there and they would be giving their things to the Lord and so forth. And sometimes the pastor would come down and he'd stand there and he'd say, well, what is your issue? And they'd, they'd be praying for it and so forth, right? And they'd be down and all this kind of stuff. And here's the funny thing is that we say, Lord, I just give it all to you right now, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for delivering me. Thank you for the breakthrough. Thank you for the release. All this wonderful stuff, right? And then as the pastor turns around and turns his back, get ready to walk down, we do this number here. We go back down and we just pick up. We don't want nobody looking at it because we don't want nobody to see us looking down. So we just pick up and we walk back to our seat. And here's the thing. Oftentimes we pick up our mess and somebody else's too. Yeah, come on now. <laughs> because you never really let it go. When you go to the altar, the very illustration of the altar means you're just taking it to burn it up, to give it away. It's done. It's done. So, it's in the last part of verse 9 that Peter reveals the greatest revelation of the good life. 
He says this. He's speaking to us about our gift. He says, verse 9d, that we're called to inherit a blessing. You see, Christians were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the earth. That's Ephesians 1.4. And our blessing was one that we did not deserve. It was a gift that we could not earn. And the gift is forgiveness. And we should know how very well how to give the gift of forgiveness because we have been forgiven. Do you know... Every time you blow it with God, he doesn't sit there and go, Oh, John. Oh, help me, Lord. Are we going through this again? Please. He doesn't do that. When we blow it, here's the thing. As, 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 as he's faithful. When we repent, he restores us right back. Here's the issue. Man does not always put us back. But he does. But he does. And so I need to be able to give a blessing because I've been forgiven. And when I blow it, God doesn't go, oh, Patrick. Ah. Oh, I could have made a pig. Come on. Thank you, please. I'm just trying to help you understand how to live the good life. Come on. So now when we pick up where we left off, Peter shares with us the last two commands for living the good life. In verses 10 through 11, he tells us that we must live by the right standard. And in verse 12, he says we must live, must have the right incentive. And so it's in verse 10 that Peter tells us by whose standard we are to live and why. He says this. For the one who desires life to love and to see good days must keep his lips, his tongue from, from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. So Peter here is quoting from the Old Testament, by the way. This particular passage in the rest of the section through verse 12 is taken from Psalms 34 verses 12 through 16. So Peter is literally letting us know that the people in the Old Testament also wanted to love life and to see good days. That's always been the pursuit of man. And if we are to love life and to see good days, then life must be built on the right standards. And so when you build on the right standards, by the way, here's the thing. You also start to develop the right habits. Yes. Right. That's the deal. Do you realize that most Christians who falter in their walk drift first? Do y'all realize that it's a drift? It's not, I woke up today and I'm, boom, I'm going to be here. It's somewhere along the line we start to introduce a habit, something that we were willing to accept and build upon, and the next thing you know, you are there, and by the time it becomes a full habit, you're here. And I teach this to people when we're working on something, when we're laying out designs for something, right? I said, if we're only doing a design that's going to work within six inches, being one degree off is not a big issue. But if you're working for something that's going to go for a mile or two, Being one degree off means we'll never get to where we're trying to go. So it's a drift. But you see, if we are to love life and see good days, then life must be built on the right standard, and that standard is the word of God. And here is the part that gets me. Talking to believers. Well, it doesn't mean to follow everything. Some of that doesn't really apply today. And, 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 and. Come on now. Okay, so which part doesn't apply? That's my question. That's my normal that's my normal response when you say, Well, some of it doesn't apply. Okay, yeah, we're not doing animal sacrifices no more. You're right, that part don't apply. But they're not talking about those parts. And I was like, well, how do we get to the good life? Because that's the issue, right? And so I also want you to know that Peter is using Scripture to defend his teaching and to validate its authority. Why does he do that? Because Scripture is the substantiating, authoritative word of God. Paul says this to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. He says, all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So now he's telling me even the, uh, the, uh, the sacrifice is, is a teaching. I need to learn from because it was to teach me sin caused death. So it's still applicable. Wow. 
see, Peter understood the situation the church was in when he wrote this. Because even today, we would say to Peter, to say, we would say, we would, we would say what Peter is commanding us to do is virtually impossible. So Peter is saying, look, I understand how you might be viewing this. You're living in a hostile situation. You're living in a grave difficulty. You're probably wondering how life could be any worse than it is. This is where they were at. And here I am coming along telling you, you must live harmonious and sympathetically and brotherly with kindness and with humility and that, and never retaliate and never insult back. See, this is what he's telling them, right? And they're going through this deal and they're receiving this plus more ugly and all of this experience, right? And you were probably saying to yourself, this can't be true, Peter, please. You've got to be kidding me. This doesn't even seem reasonable. That we can't strike back, that we can't retaliate. That's the issue. Like I said, we're built for the fight. But God's people, we're built to be peacemakers. That's the part we don't, we like it, but we don't like it. Right? We're built to be peacemakers. Right. Peacemakers. And so to reinforce what he has said, Peter says, just in case someone, some of your questioning, have questions about my teaching, I want you to know that everything I've said comes from the word of God. And so he quotes them right out of Psalms 34. For that little word for in the beginning of that, verse 10 is interesting. That signals the authority for what Peter just said in verses 8 and 9. And so for the word for could be translated as do this for, or better yet, because that's what scripture says. And so that's what I teach the guys and here too as well. I don't want you to ever walk out here and say, Pastor said, I want you to be able to say the word of God said. That's why I give you so much scripture. And so when I'm teaching on Tuesday night, I'm teaching them through the word. I'm giving them the word. I'm giving them the scriptures and so forth because I want them to be able to say, this is what the word of God says. Because see, when you know it for yourself, no one can Jedi mind trick you. But here's something I need for you to understand and see. A key and often overlooked aspect of God's goodness is that he doesn't give us commands we cannot fulfill. I will say that again. He does not give us commands that we cannot fulfill. He doesn't taunt us with impossible directions or challenge us with tasks beyond our ability. See, the part of the issue is that each one of God's commands to us is that it's done through the assistance of his Holy Spirit. We often forget to bring that part with us. The Spirit. Where we're able to accomplish what he's commanded us to do. That's why in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, listen to what Peter writes. His divine power has given to us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. He says his divine power has given us everything, right? So when you receive salvation, everything you need to make it through this life came in the package. It's there. The issue is this. It's just like, I I love, I'm a visual person, y'all know this. Men, I'm picking on us. Buy us an electronic item, and we want it to do a single thing, but even though it comes with this wonderful booklet and this wonderful remote, and it does a thousand things, we never figure out the other thousand. We got that one down. (laughs) And even though you're missing out on the full blessing of what the TV could do or the DVD could do or the satellite could do for you or the radio could do for you, as long as you're able to get out of it that one thing, that's where you come to. You get your lounge chair out. And the TV comes on and your show shows up. We're good. Amen. But you spent more money for other things, even though you didn't really think you needed them at the time. And that's kind of how we are with our faith and our salvation. God said, I've given you everything you need for life and for godliness. And now that you've got your salvation, I got what I need. And we stop. And we're not called to stop. You need to fully finish unpacking everything that he's given you. That grace, that mercy, that perseverance, those are the things that came with it. Everything that you need, that humility, that that, 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 that sympathetic heart, that kindness, that brotherly, all that was in it. All of it's in it. But you have to be willing to grow in it. You see, you know 
by natural beings with our children and with yourself. And if you're honest, if you gave your child everything they're supposed to have right now at the time when they're a baby, they don't know what to do with it. But as they develop and they grow, they learn a little bit more and a little bit more and the things that you want to give them now make sense. And they start to appreciate it and they're starting to be able to use it and it starts to be applicable in their life. That's the thing. He gave us everything we needed right now in us just so that we would start to unpack it as you grow in Him. That's the beauty of this deal. Because I don't... <laughs> I often say if I knew now, back then, when I was younger, oh my God, that'd be such a greater version of Patrick. Right? I think yeah, all of us would probably say that too. We'd like to go back to our younger self and go, son, <laughs> let me give you this little pieces of information that you really need to pay attention to. Because if you do this, you will avoid a lot of heartache. But we don't get to do that. But you do get to do this. You get to say, God, thank you for not leaving me the way you found me. Thank you, Father, for not leaving me the way you found me. That's what you get to say. Right? So Peter tells us in verse 10a. Who it is that desires life to love and see good days. He says, for the one who desires life to love and see good days, Peter describes Christians as the ones who desires life to love and see good days. Just as Christ and the apostles lived and ministered by the ultimate standard of the Holy Scriptures, today Christians must also live by that same ultimate standard of the Holy Scriptures. And that's the issue. We think the Scriptures have changed because time has changed. The scriptures don't change. God's feeling about sin has not changed. He's not changed his mind about how he feels about the situation as he laid it out in word. Just because you're in 2017 at this point, looking at 2018, God has not changed in his perspective on sin and the precepts and, the, and, 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 and what he's called us and commanded us to do in his word. It hasn't changed. But we think because we find enough people who feel and think the same way we do that it's right. And it's not. It's not. The same standard. Do you think God does, wants less obedience today than he did back then? Do you, want, do you think he wants less love? Less mercy? Less grace? Less humility? No! He wants the same. Somebody would say more, but no, he still wants the same. The same what he desired back then is the same that he desires here today. He desires that his people to reflect who he is and all things. You see, if we want to enjoy God's gift of the good life, Jesus says these words in Matthew chapter 4, verse 4. Jesus answered and said, It is written that man does not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. That's what he says how we are to live. By every word that comes from the mouth of God. And so, we're called to be peacemakers, we're called to speak blessings, we're called to be sympathetic, we're called to be humble, we're called to be uh, uh, um, kind-hearted, we're called to be brotherly, we're called not to to render evil for evil. Is he asking you to do anything that doesn't look like the sun? Right? Many of you have children, and guess what, when I see your children, oftentimes I'm looking at another reproduction of you. You, I see the characteristics of mommy and daddy and the children, right? And so here's what Jesus and God is simply telling us. If you are my child, then I need to be represented in you. Not where I got to squint my eyes and go, well, there could be a little Jesus there. (laughs) There is something special about the word life used here. The word life used here in the Greek is called zoen, Z-O-E-E-N, which means experiencing all the richness of living life to the fullest. That's what he's saying. 
And not really living as opposed to dying, which is bios. The word love used here also in the Greek is the agapian word, which is the strongest form of the emotion that notes a strong willed affection or desire. Now listen to how he describes Christians. The ones who desire life to the fullest is what he's saying. And to love and to see good days. This is what he's saying, who we are in him. Ones who desire life to the fullest and love with a strong will. You see in verse 10b, Peter goes on to tell us that if we desire life and love and love to see good days, then we have to do something with our tongue. He says it must keep, must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. So Peter shares the one who desires life to love and see good days must refrain from speaking anything that comes from the underlying evil of an immoral disposition. And he identifies the tongue as the catalyst from which these things come from. The tongue is so often unruly and prone to sin. The tongue reveals who you really are. You can dress it up, put your Sunday go to meeting clothes on. Spout your Christian type verbs, verses, and all that good kind of stuff, right? But eventually, all I got to do is hang around with you long enough. I knew a bunch of little kids who loved to be around the older ladies at the church in the country. Because they'd be all, oh, God, thank you, Jesus. They'd get, hit you with a scripture. They'd break out the anointing oil and all this good kind of stuff. But if they just hung around with, I wouldn't even call her name because I love her that much. Long enough, you're going to hear her say something. That ain't in the Bible. You're going to hear her, right? And the kids would love walking around behind her because they knew if they hung around long enough, somebody, she's going to meet somebody or somebody's going to come into her pathway and all of a sudden she's going to bless them. And the kids go, oh my God, did you hear that? And I'd be like, oh, sweet Jesus. Because see, it, it eventually tells off on you. The tongue will tell you what's on the inside. Right. This is why James says in James chapter 3 verse 6, he says this, The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person and sets the whole course of his life on fire. And itself is set on fire by hell. And here is the issue, right? This is a true statement. The tongue. You ever see anybody who said something and then tried to take it back and it changed your opinion of them? Come on, Pastor. You are so right. It set the whole course of that person's life in that direction. The little pink thing in your mouth. Sometimes you might want to get used to the taste of the blood and just bite down on that rascal. See, in addition to refraining from verbal retaliation, he says we must also stop our lips from speaking deceit. So Christians must be absolutely committed to the truth. Maybe I should say on Tuesdays. <laughs> but you see, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 3 through 4 says this. Do not let kindness and truth leave you. It says, bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart so that you will find favor and good repute in the sight of God and man. You see, people may never like you. Ever. But if you stand on truth and you speak truth, they will eventually have to respect what you stand for. Do you get it? See, when you're able to stand on truth and speak truth with kindness and so forth and so on, they may never like you as a person, but here's the thing. They will eventually have to come to a place where they respect what you say because it is the truth. And we must stop, and we must be opposed to all forms of lying and deception and hypocrisy. I don't know who told a lie that a little white lie was okay, and we bought into it. See, I, I, y'all know I talk about my grandmother a lot, and I love her. God bless her soul. Um, she's the one who taught me, you always tell the truth. And so, my grandmother is also the lady who taught me a child should stay in a child's place, too. 
And so y'all probably heard me tell this story before that folks came by the house and asked Granny about something and, and Granny was giving them an answer that she hadn't told us in the house. In the house we heard the real thing, right? And so I go, uh-uh, Granny, you said, and all of a sudden went, poof! <laughs> Right? Yeah. See, you ain't ever been, you know, you ain't ever been hit till you not had a pause knocked into you. <laughs> you know where it hurts so deep that the sound can't catch up with the hurt. <laughs> right? See, that's how I came up. So I know, I know this. I've heard this before I got to the place where I can understand it for myself. I know what she had told us, right? And I'm like, oh, Granny, you. And then she just. Your own house, baby. And I'm trying to find my air. <laughs> you see, because here's why. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16 to 19 says this. There are six things in which the Lord hates. Yes, seven which are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that run rapidly to evil, a false witness who utters lies, and one who spend, who spreads strife among the brothers. Wow. You see... We're not going to be perfect. But that's our goal. See, I don't want to ever set the bar low. Because here's what I know about human nature. Wherever we set the bar, we're more inclined to come in just right underneath it. Very rarely do we ever exceed it or hit it. We set the bar and then boom. So God's bar is always high. It's high because it should be high. It's high because he is high. It's high because his standards are high. His virtues are high. His precepts and concepts are high. And so therefore, everyone that's called to be his child should live up to those things. Now, here's the deal. You will not hit the bar. Oftentimes, we're going to come in and run underneath, but I don't want it down here. See, I love that. I didn't always love it because it hurts to strive for high. It's difficult. It's uncomfortable. It's unpopular when you strive for high. But it doesn't change what we're to go to. He doesn't care that you're uncomfortable. You're called to be uncomfortable. See, we, we, I, this is the thing as we get ready to come out of this, is, is this. Do you think the cross was uncomfortable? Do you think the beating he took was uncomfortable? Do you think when they said, who do you want released you, and they yelled out, Barabbas, Barabbas, do you think that was uncomfortable? Do you think when after he had done all these miracles and blessings for them, they said, crucify, 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 do you think that was uncomfortable? Did he throw in the towels and he go, well, that Dion's not worth it? No! He went through all the uncomfortable and plus some to be put in a borrowed tomb that he didn't have one for him. Do you think that wasn't uncomfortable? So here's the thing, that when you find yourself being uncomfortable representing him, press on! Because now you're in good company. You're in good company when you have to press on for him. Because see, you, you can't soar with the eagles when you're walking with turkeys. I ain't seen a turkey one soar with an eagle. Right? Press on. But listen to what Paul writes in Colossians chapter 3, verse 9. He says, do not lie to one another since you have laid aside the old self with this, with this evil practices. You see, Jesus shares the matter of speech or control, not in the mouth, but on the inside. He says this in Matthew chapter 12, verse 34. For the mouth speaks out of what fills the heart. It's what fills the heart. 
And so it's in verse 11 that Peter gives four straightforward commands drawn from Psalm 34, verse 14. He says this, that he, he must turn away from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. And so first of all, Peter tells us that a Christian must turn away from evil. The verb turn away in the Greek means to intensely, strongly rejection of what is sinful. It is a strong rejection of what is sinful in the treatment of others. And we are to turn away from that, even those who persecute us. So once again, he's saying, turn away, don't knuckle up. Turn away. away. Proverbs chapter 3 verse 7 says this. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. For Paul writes in Romans 12, 14, Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. And so Peter also says this, Let him do good. May I add this right here, that the good life is not doing evil? Secondly, Peter commanded the church to do good. That is sharply contrasted against what the world is saying is the good life, which is doing your own thing. Doing whatever feels good. Sex, drugs, parties all at the expense of disobeying God's will. See, the good life is doing what is good, and that word good, and what is defined as, it means excellent in quality. In Him. Excellent in quality in Him. I love it when I know what the true definition is. Do do y'all ever wonder why at the the top of your outline there's a definition just about every week when I give a message to you? (laughs) To point you in the direction where we're going. To reestablish it. To reaffirm it. Because this is always about doing good in Him. In Him. Because, see, if I do good according to my perspective, it doesn't mean it's His. Doesn't mean it's his. So therefore, unless my life lines up with his, then I, when I do it then, then my perspective will line up with him. I have to make it real plain because, see, I'm called to equip. And so when he's whooping me and me in here because I have issues. Pastor has issues. And so God has to deal with me before I can come and try to win souls for him. He's got to work this bull boy over. And so we must do what expresses a deep down virtue before the Lord. And then Peter goes on to say, let him seek peace. Do y'all realize that that is a command? Amen. It is a command to seek peace. Man, how come he couldn't say like every other third lunar year or something? Right? But he's saying, I have to seek peace. There are people in our families right now that we need to seek peace with. Real. We need to, because see, here's the thing, is that we know that we haven't done anything to them, but all of a sudden they're angry with us, and next thing you know, we ain't talking. And here's what I will tell you about silence. Silence doesn't mean everything's okay. It doesn't. Because, see, here's what happens in silence. The peanut gallery is running. And when the peanut gallery is running and we're thinking of the other person, the peanut gallery is never thinking that the other person is thinking good things about them. Only the worst. Only the worst. Even though the other person hasn't literally said anything, we have no evidence of what you're thinking in the peanut gallery is true. We act upon as if it is true. And it just emboldens us to be even more angry at the person. Even though nothing really has been said. Why do you think scripture says, don't let the sun go down on your anger? Why do you think that? You thought it was just going to make sure you have a good night's sleep? It short circuits that opportunity for the peanut gallery to get in the way and harm us in our relationships. And by the way, the word here for seek is the strongest form of the of seeking in the Greek. It's zeto, z e t e o, and it means to seek with all of one's might, seek peace, seek tranquility, harmony, and unity without conflict. And the fourth commandment was this: is to pursue it. And as Christians, we are to pursue peace. The word p- pursue in the Greek means to hunt. We are.
are to aggressively hunt for peace, even with our persecutors and those who do not know Christ. The term for peace here has the idea of a constant condition, a constant condition of tranquility, which produces permanent joy and permanent happiness. And as Christians, we should be the greatest blessing in any culture. We are to be the peacemakers. This is, this is to be the nature of our living. The Beatitudes reminds us of this, doesn't it? In Matthew chapter 5, verse 9, Jesus says this in the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Amen. So, so many Christians are doing the opposite today on so many fronts. We are to make peace as much as is possible without compromising truth. You don't surrender peace for, or truth for peace. You don't. You make peace as much as you can without compromising truth. God never says you give up truth for the peace. Right. Come on, Pastor. That's the thing. Too often we're willing to give up truth just to have peace. Wrong motive. Wrong motive. Romans 12, 18 says, If it's possible, as far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Romans 14, 19 says, So then we pursue the things which make for peace in the building up of one another. So here's the deal. Do you realize that when you are a peacemaker, when you're blessed and you know that you're blessed, that when someone has wronged you and you seek peace with them and you seek to build them up, not to cut their knees out from underneath them. Do you see why he's saying this is how you have the good life? Because here's the deal. When you're able to take enemies away without them even realizing that they're being removed out of your path. That's the best, best place to be. That when enemies show up, you have ability to eliminate them, not by killing them off, but by loving them off. Do you see the difference? free to keep going on. They may still be whoever they want to be, but they're not an enemy to me. These are lessons that, oh my God. I watched my pop when my mom and dad went through their divorce. I watched my mom ruin his trucking business. All those things. I watched him come to her after she'd done all those things. New Year's Eve party. He knocks on the door. Party's jumping off. He asked to speak to her for a moment outside. And she wouldn't even give him a moment outside. She brought him inside and ridiculed him in front of a whole bunch of people. He came to ask her to come back. Even after she had done all this stuff. See, peacemaker, peacemaker, and he walked out that door and he left after she had made fun of him and some of the men and there was talking bad about him. Talking about, look at this big old dude coming here big and right. I watched him leave, and I wanted to be like that man so bad because in my heart I wanted to knock my mama out. Because she harmed a good man. And so, I was old enough to say who I wanted to live with. And that's why I got to live with my pop. Because he showed me what it looks like to desire life, to love, and to see good days. So... What God is telling us, what he's teaching us, we can live out in him. Always. But in verse 12, we're closing. Peter now closes out the secret to having the good life by telling us we must have the right incentive. And this is what he says. For the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous, and his ears attend to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. See, that is the right incentive. Peter quotes here from Psalms 34, verse 15 and 16, vividly fixes the reality that should be in the mind of all Christians. And it should be that 
It should be the motive for us to live lives pleasing to God. The psalmist's words describes a sovereign ruling God who sees all, who knows all, who holds people accountable for their behavior and threatens punishment for their disobedience. But for Peter, the primary issue here is not judgment, but God's gracious care for his people. You see, the eyes of the Lord is a old, a common Old Testament phrase that relates to God's special care and watchfulness over His people. In Proverbs five twenty one, it says this: "For the Lord, what, for the for the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord, and He watches all His paths." And so Peter is emphasizing God's all-knowing awareness of every detail of a believer's life. And King David writes about this in Psalms one thirty nine verses one through six, where he says this. O oh Lord, you have, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You understand my thoughts from afar. You scrutinize my path and my lying down and are intimately acquainted with all my ways. Even before, even before there is a word on my tongue, behold, O oh Lord, you know it all. He says, you have enclosed me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high and I cannot attain to it. See, he's saying God knows everything. Is that not an encouragement to you that God knows everything? He sees everything and he's watching over you and he's looking to protect you and he's looking to answer your prayers. Isn't that enough motivation as an incentive to live for him? Because he knows how much ugly is coming into your life. He knows how much good is coming into your life. He knows how much <laughs> is coming into your life, right? He knows when your kids are going astray. He knows when your spouse is going astray. He knows when the job is not doing right. He knows when the car is going to break down. But yet he's still God. He never leaves us. He never goes to sleep. He never gets tired. He never says, not today. This is the incentive of why we should live for him. Because here it is. His eyes are looking toward the righteous. So that he can attend to their prayers. And the word prayer here is translated, it means the petition, the supplication to our, when he, he, it relates to our crying out to God to meet our needs. And then Paul writes these beautiful words in Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 7. He says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding or comprehension, depending on your translation, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That's the incentive. God is always fully aware of everything in the lives of his children. And it should be the great incentive for us to live lives as Peter has outlined, knowing that we have confidence that the Lord is always watching and waiting and ready to hear and answer our prayers. But Peter tells us, on the other hand, the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. This is another Old Testament concept. Face of the Lord refers to judgment. His eyes represents his all-seeing knowing. Whereas his face in this context context represents the manifestation of his anger and displeasure. God's wrath is against those who do evil and those who disobey his word. You see, John writes these words in Revelation chapter 6, verse 16 to 17. He says, they call to the mountains and the rocks. Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come. Who can stand? You see, here's the thing as we close. Christians, whether today or in Peter's time, have always had to contend with a hostile world. We don't get out of this situation without the battle. But we can live humbly and respond to persecution in the Christ-like manner and adhere to God's standard of authority because we have the promise that even in the midst of trying circumstances, God is still watching over us, protecting us, and ready to extend his blessings to us. You see, the good life is not anything that the world offers. The good life, that life that is full of good days, is the life that remembers God. The life that is lived according to his standard. 
you see uh, as I said this morning I came in singing trouble in my way I have to cry sometimes and he goes on and says so much trouble in my way I have to moan sometimes he even goes on and says I lay awake at night but that's all right. All right. Because I know Jesus will fix it. And everything will be all right. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. God, I thank you for this day. I thank you for these, your people who pressed their way to be a part of this experience, Master. Once again, Father, I pray that all that was shared today was acceptable in thy sight. God, you are so good. You are better to us than we could ever be to ourselves. And so even right now, Father God, as we come with our eyes closed and our heads bowed down to Mother Earth, God, we lift our hearts up to you. There may be someone here this morning that does not know you as their own personal Lord and Savior. And if you're here, don't let the challenges of life your past failures, your current situation prevents you from receiving what you stand in need of. If you want to know this Jesus for yourself, just simply raise your hand. This is your opportunity. God already knows it all. Secret sin doesn't make a difference. The fact that his mercies were renewed in in your body today and there's life inside of you, you have another chance to join him. Is there one? And even now, Father, we thank you. I thank you for your people. I ask your blessing, Father God, that you would bless us all collectively, then bless us individually for what we stand in need of. And even now, Master, we prepare our hearts and minds to share in our offering. God, bless the offering that we're about to receive. May be used for the uplifting and building of your kingdom. Bless those who have it to give and bless those who have it not. For the next opportunity, they'd be to do so and do so cheerfully. And Father God, we'll be forever careful. Try always remember to give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory. And it's in your darling Son, Christ Jesus, mighty and holy name, we ask it all. And the body of Christ says, amen and amen.